Okay, I think we're going to start. Uh, hello and welcome everybody for joining us to uh, for today's webinar. Today, the OECD launched its Education Policy Outlook 2019, working together to help students achieve their potential. Through the Education Policy Outlook, the OECD monitors the evolution of policy priorities and policy developments in a range of countries from early childhood education all the way through to adult education. The 2019 edition of Education Policy Outlook analyzes the evolution of key education priorities and, po and policies in 43 education systems. The report includes around 460 education policy developments on topics related to school improvement, evaluation and assessment, governance and funding. Uh, and it looks into what is being done as well as why and how it works to help education systems gain better understanding of how policies can have greater opportunities of, of success in their specific context. Andreas Schleicher, Director of Education and Skills at the OECD, is joining us today to talk about the key findings from Education Policy Outlook 2019. And please feel free to send your questions in at any time during the presentation. And you can send those to the email address edu.contact at oecd.org. Also, the PowerPoint that Andreas is about to present will be made available online. Andreas, over to you. Thanks so much. And this is really a special day. You know, most of the work that you see from the OECD is about what in education, uh, what we do, with what success, what students experience. And this report is about the how. How do we actually get things done? How do we translate ideas into successful schools and successful classroom experiences? The issue around policy implementation. And I have with me my colleague Diana Toledo, who is actually the author of this report and has worked on this for several years. Let me sort of <clears throat> just frame this. Now, I think we all understand the value that education provides for you know, people's employment, for people's earnings. We are also beginning to understand some of the social outcomes and even societal outcomes, like the level of trust seems to be quite strongly related to literacy. So I don't think we are short of arguments for the value proposition of education, but when it comes to how to actually get things done, that's where things become really, really difficult. And that's really what this book is about. Now, uh, we, it is so much easier to educate young people for our own past than for their future. Uh, education is a very conservative social environment. And sometimes as parents, we are more part of the problem than part of the solution. Now we get very anxious when children learn things that we no longer understand, or we get even more anxious when they <clears throat> no longer learn things that were so terribly important for us. Teachers sometimes are more likely to teach how they were taught than how they were taught to teach. And as a politician, you can lose an election over education when things go wrong, but you rarely win an election on education simply because it takes so many years to translate good ideas into better outcomes. The Industrial Revolution somehow taught us how to educate second class robots, you know, to make people compliant with the norms of the industrial society and so on. And uh, but we still in the time and the age of artificial intelligence, we have to think much harder about what it means to be successful in these times today. How we develop first class humans, humans who can make ethical decisions, who can, you know, create new knowledge, who can manage tensions and dilemmas and manage and resolve conflicts. So I think those are really big questions that require new thinking and also new ways of translating ideas into practice. Uh, and sometimes, you know, we are tempted to say, well, you know, let's just use, you know, more money or more time. And uh, it's not that easy. On the chart here, you can see the amount of time that students spend in school in blue and in yellow, the amount of time that students spend learning outside of school. And you can see that varies hugely across countries. Now you can take a country like the United Arab Emirates, where students spend close to 60 hours learning per week, now more than what we as adults are typically working. And you go to the other side of the spectrum, you can see Finland, where this is a little bit more than 35 hours. So almost twice as much time in the UAE than in Finland. But 
again, you know, that's just the volume of time that is invested. When you look at productivity and you know, how much do students actually learn per hour of instruction, you can see that in Finland, students learn a lot in very little time, whereas in the United Arab Emirates, they spend a lot of time and learn relatively little. So I think uh, it's not just enough to do more of the same in the time in which we live. We have to ask ourselves much more carefully, how do we deploy resources best? And what are the kind of spending choices that we make to get things done? Now you can, on this chart, you can see the relationship between spending per student and the quality of learning outcomes as measured by our PISA comparisons. It's very tenuous now. For countries that invest very little, money makes a lot of a difference. Now, that's the countries in the yellow line. But as you move towards, you know, most countries in the industrialized world, you can see actually money itself doesn't explain most of the outcomes. And this just highlights. Them. And uh, when you dig behind this, this is something that we did for <clears throat> the first time this year, sort of what drives spending. You can also see that countries make very, very different spending choices. Now. One way in which you can invest money is to pay your teachers well. And you know that's intuitively one of the factors that should drive the uh, quality of education because the quality of education can never exceed the quality of teachers. So, you know, getting great people into the profession with financially attractive, you know, jobs should be one way to get them. And you can see Germany comes out number one on this. But, you know, even Germany has great difficulties these days to recruit talented people into the teaching profession. Lots of teacher shortages. Money alone is not enough to make jobs attractive. It's not just a question of making teaching financially attractive, but also making it intellectually attractive. I look, for example, at Finland. You know, and Finland is the country which is probably still most attractive for teachers. They get at least 10 applications for every teaching post, despite the fact that, as you can see here, Finland spends a little bit, little more than the average country on the salaries of its people. But obviously, it provides some other things that make teaching choose that job. You know, working with colleagues, being very engaged in the development of the system, having opportunities to, to do research, to work with individual students, or Estonia. You know, one is one of the other top performing systems in the Western world, and you can see they do really well in school, but they pay their teachers rather poorly. So money alone is not is part of money is part of the answer, but not the sole answer. To this. Another way in which you can spend money is simply, you know, to give students more time. But you've seen before, you know, it's no longer just a question of the volume of time. It's more a question of productivity. Look at Australia. They, they are coming out num what number one on this chart. Yet another way of spending money is to give teachers time to do other things in teaching. You know? And that's where things start to get interesting. Actually, many hot performing countries invest in this. You know? They basically ensure that teachers are not just delivering classroom lessons, but they are also engaged in professional learning communities. They're actually engaged in sort of <clears throat> being mentors and facilitators. And other many other activities. They work with students out of the classroom, no? engage in social activities. No? You can see that's driving costs. Poland is a good example where a lot of money is being invested in this. And then, last but not least, you can see you know a smaller class will drive your costs up. There's no country where you can see that more clearly than in Austria. So what you can see when you look across is very very different spending patterns. And in other words, it tells us we probably haven't really figured out how to spend money best no? when people are spending their money so differently. And this sums up you know, quite to quite different spending levels. Compare two countries at the center, no? Japan and Greece. Many people would think, you know, Japan, high performing education system must spend tons of money on education. And Greece, you know, not doing so well, uh, will not spend very much. But actually, they come out pretty close to the average when it comes to the share of the national income they put into <clears throat> the instructional system. But as you can see here, Japan makes a priority of, you know, trying to pay their teachers relatively well, giving their teachers time for other things in teaching, and they pay for that largely with having relatively large classes. So they invest their money in the teachers and they save on the size of classes. When you look to Greece, what makes a Greek education system expensive is first of all a relatively small class, and then that teachers don't uh, spend so many hours teaching. 
but also Greece can spend its money only once. So the downside of this is that they pay their teachers really poorly and students have little time to learn. So then that is almost the reverse choice, that the money is being put into kind of smaller classes and it's paid for with actually poorer teaching employment conditions. So two countries spending similar amounts investing their resources very differently. And that's really about, and much of this is about the political economy. Now, everybody these days, you know, likes smaller classes. A lot of money has been put in making classes smaller. Here you, are, here you have an example of primary education. In most countries, the blue bars are shorter than the, uh, the green bars. Now, 2017, classes were smaller than in 2005. But, you know, don't forget that often that has come at an expense. Now, when you look, for example, in many of the countries that have made classes smaller, they've paid for that with lower teacher salaries. They're not always, but often. So again, it's those kinds of trade-offs that are very difficult for policymakers to make, and they really relate to questions around policy implementation. What are the right choices? How can I defend those kinds of choices? Often, you know, the benefits of educational change are in the long run, the costs are today. If I make the classes smaller, I make myself very popular today among teachers, among parents, and I pay for this today. If I invest in the quality of teachers, I'm going to see the benefits in many, many years to come, <coughs> but the costs are incurring today. And that explains why you know many of the choices are made in the way you've seen them here. And uh, But let me bring you to the education policy outlook, uh, looking at some of the key trends. One of the things uh, that we have done is actually looking at over you know, 470 policy developments in 43 countries, really sort of looking in, in quite some detail about what has been done, how things have been implemented, what have been their results. And uh, you find it compiled in this ra ra rather big volume. And you know, many people ask, you know, can't you say these things in a more succinct way? But when you talk about policy implementation, that's where things get really, really difficult. The devil of policy implementation is always in the details. And you sum up things in bullet points, it looks very beautiful. And then you actually ask yourself, you know, what makes things work or what makes things fail? You need to understand the details. So that's where the kind of volume really comes from. Now, looking at the content, what have we seen? Now, we looked at, you know, what countries are prioritizing, you can see a lot of effort is put in understanding how to divide responsibility across the entire system. Education systems have become incredibly complex. More and more stakeholders play an active role at the local level, at the school level, at the kind of regional, at the central level. Uh, there are more outside players getting involved in the media, the parents, and so on. So, and, and just thinking through how do we do this best? What are the kind of things that every of those stakeholders is best positioned to do in a rational way uh, is very important. You, know, you can, everybody talks about, you know, it's great to be devolved, to put responsibility to the front line, but what if those people at the front line are not very well prepared for this, don't have the capacity? And uh, sometimes we end up with just decentralizing bureaucracy. So it's not so easy. And you can see that was a top. A, a headache for most policymakers. Defining national education priorities and goals, you know, target setting is a quite popular thing, particularly for incoming governments to do. Now, thinking through, you know, where do we want to end up with? What is sometimes missing are the intermediate steps in this. Now, and it was at least our analysis. You can see number three, engaging stakeholders in decision making. Now, one thing that we learned very clearly is that, you know, if you don't engage stakeholders, the teachers, the school leaders, the parents, in the design of policies, uh, they're not going to help you with implementation. Uh, we, we talk a lot about, you know, parents, we talk a lot about teachers. We perhaps don't yet talk enough about students as stakeholders. That's something also when we discussed this report today with, you know, policymakers around the world, that's one of the topics that student organizations are bringing up now that we are still designing education systems mainly around the needs and interests and conveniences of adults and see their students pretty much at the consuming. And, and that's perhaps also, you know, something that we need to rethink. 
uh, how do we increase or at least maintain educational expenditure? One of the things that we see that in many countries, actually countries spend a declining share of their national resources, uh, public expenditure on education. No? And that's true for many other future oriented investments as well. Now, there is a temptation in policy and practice, you know, to spend on things that we need today and to save on things that we need to uh, maybe in the long run. Now we trade in the future for the present. And that's not just true in education. You know, we do the same thing with the environment. I think uh, that is one of the big dilemmas of our time. You know? We are all, you know, trying to have a good life today and uh, we're thinking less and less about the future. And, uh, it's difficult for students to put an effort into learning when the world of work is no longer clear. No, is it worse for me to study hard? Do I, will I get a job? Will um, Is it good for new employers ask themselves, why should I invest in the training of my workers if then they leave my company? You know, labor mobility works against. And then again, for politicians, uh, isn't it better? I build roads and kind of infrastructure, which people value today, rather than you know spend and invest in the next generation. So that is, you know, ranking number four shows really uh, that's one of the big issues for educators. But uh, number five is a new aspect, and that has actually, you know, grown in importance. How do we use the money, the time, the people, the spaces most effectively? That is something that perhaps we have ignored too much in the past. We've always assumed, you know, resources, more resources are going to be better. But I think the question of efficiency is, is coming up. And then also equity in resource allocation. How do we attract the most talented teachers to the most challenging classrooms? How do we get the best school leaders for the most difficult schools? And aligning resources with needs. How do we make our education systems truly inclusive. Uh, so those are the top rated priorities at the system level. When you look at the institutions, you can see that improving teacher qualifications, <coughs> skills and training comes out on top. And again, that's no surprise because the quality of education will never exceed the quality of teaching and teachers. But then also, you know, evaluation uh, components, uh, the kind of culture that helps us to see what we are achieving for students, for teachers, for schools, for the system, uh, often done in a very fragmented way, very top-down way. This idea of formative evaluation is often quite remote. No? Uh, how do we balance internal and external components of evaluation and so on? Attracting and retaining teachers also very important again you know making teaching both financially and intellectually attractive one of the major challenges uh, for us so those are topics that sort of rank very high when it again, uh, comes to institutions and that's basically that what what has also motivated us to structure the book around uh, some of those topics now we put a lot of emphasis on governance on school improvement on funding and on the issue around evaluation and assessment. So that's basically what you find the bulk of the volume uh, devoted to. Let me sort of just sort of make one point that is really central to this book. What we realize is that many of the things that we tend to talk about most, you know, the size of classes, the salaries of teachers, the number of hours of instruction, the infrastructure, the learning conditions, now, they are really just a very small tip of a very large iceberg. No? And that's what we see, that's what we talk about, but actually 90% of what makes education reform succeeding or failing lies under the waterline. And that's where the big collisions occur, because those things we don't have on our radar screen. No? That's basically about the motivations, the interests, the fears of people, no? People involved, parents included, teachers included. Now, what is the reform going to mean for me? Is it requiring me to change behavior? Is it going to last? You know, if a new government tells me I should do things differently, how do I know that this is going to last more than four or five years? Those issues are very, very real. And we've seen when we analyze the reforms where those issues are not taken on board in the design of reform, in the way we communicate reforms, we are unlikely to achieve lasting success. Now we move the tip of the iceberg, but the rest stays where it is. And that's actually, you know, 
also when you look at this book, you know, several hundred pages of things that have been done. And when you look at changes in results, it's very hard always to relate, you know, policies to outcomes. But what we can see is over that same period for which we analyze those kinds of changes, we've seen very, very little movement in either the quality or equity of educational outcomes. So again, you know, this kind of part that is under the radar screen, under the waterline, is what we devote the bulk of this publication to. And uh, some of this is difficult to quantify. I admit that. You know, many of the descriptions in, in the book are tentative. You know, often it's very hard to, to foresee how things are going to play out. But it's our best effort to understand reform, design implementation, and the trajectory of policy implication implementation in a holistic way. A couple of takeaways. Uh, obviously, you know, teacher skills will remain always at the key. And uh, what we have seen actually is a shift from, you know, just, you know, educating teachers really well before they get into schools towards uh, creating a, a, an environment that keeps teachers learning in their careers, putting more professional development in the school, at the workplace, where teachers basically integrate, you know, working and learning. It's more or less so the, the idea of high-quality apprenticeship kind of models where work-based learning is really an integral part of the learning process. And that's something that actually, interestingly, see, uh, we see that now in many countries, a big shift. You know, we can no longer expect that we can educate teachers once for their working lives, but their work is going to change every day, every moment. And they need to be motivated, they need to be ready to actually cope with those kinds of unforeseen challenges. We also see that uh, uh, fostering collaboration across administrative levels or between institutions is really key. In the past, most of the relationships in an education system have been vertical. Uh, you report to your school principal, your school principal reports to the local community. And the key today is really how do you get teachers to work together to frame good practice, you know, learn from each other's experiences. It's easy to push new ideas into schools, you know, but we don't know whether they are good or bad. What is much, much harder is to find the really good ideas in the classroom and to scale them, to spread them, to ensure that good practice that is somewhere happening is becoming part of the system. So a big effort in policy design to actually foster collaboration across different levels and between institutions. Mentoring, dialogue, collaboration, those are really the hallmarks of most of the changes that we have analyzed. We have heard today from a colleague in, in Sweden, they have very, very carefully engineered a program. You know, they found that their mathematics skills in this, of students, they are unsatisfactory, and uh, they've engineered a very kind of <clears throat> carefully engineered a program that would bring teachers skills uh, to a higher level. Finding out with teachers, with mentors, with experts, you know, uh, how good mass teaching really, really looks at. Then basically asking teachers to implement some of those ideas, reviewing those ideas again with a mentor and sort of gradually uh, integrating learning process in the kind of practice. Second takeaway, whole system thinking is starting to take hold. So people see reform efforts increasingly as part of a kind of uh, bigger whole, and that's very important. Uh, uh, reforms will only have an impact if they have a meaningful you know, change on the system. Uh, and basically, you can see uh, internal school evaluations gaining traction. Uh, uh, more so than external school evaluation, we've seen less progress on this, and just probably just because lower stakes alternatives are easier to accept by stakeholders. So yeah, we did. Uh, we've seen some really good pro process on the internal aspects, external aspects, which are equally important. This outward-looking perspective is really important. We've seen sort of less change. We've seen considerable resistance. Uh, what has also been quite interesting is that uh, capacity building that is being now made an explicit component in the reform process, now understanding that actually implementing some of those ideas require a lot of kind of capacity at the kind of front line. 
national priority and target settings become a popular area of policy work. And uh, what we've seen, it's most impactful when those ideas are actually broken down into things that we can track in the short term and that we can see in very kind of local uh, contextual situations. Now, sometimes those kinds of targets are too far removed from the kind of real classrooms and real teachers. Uh, we also have seen that success comes when whole system reforms are actually supported by initiatives in other policy areas. And again, you know, you can implement an interesting new curriculum, but it requires a lot of investment in teacher development. It requires adaptation of assessment and ex examination systems. Uh, if you, uh, you know, and put the emphasis on 21st century skills in the curriculum, and then you evaluate students with the kind of outdated exams that focus on subject matter content. Those kinds of disconnects actually disrupt reforms and also discourage people to take them seriously. You'll find lots of really interesting examples of that in that publication. Very last point. Uh, uh, funding decisions, what we've seen is that money often comes in too late in that. Uh, we basically are not very good in education to uh, exert foresight, to anticipate. And so often money is being put, you know, in reforms and they're midway. And, and uh, so there is a misalignment between the ideas that we have and the way in which they are uh, resource and uh, that can be very demotivating for people who have then to make those things happen at the front line. But there are some very good examples for how you can deal with it in a proactive way. Uh, let me sort of conclude with what uh, I believe are the key messages coming out of this through all of those reforms. The first really has to do with how do you build and share uh, uh, create a shared vision vision in the system that's really about building trust in students trust in teachers trust in schools trust in ideas that they you know last over across space and over time um that that is one of the most fundamental challenges you know as we all know trust takes a long time to build can be easily destroyed and uh, really requires a very constructive uh, collaboration, also a high degree of transparency. The overall picture is not so good in our societies. You can see really when you look at confidence in national governments, in most countries, the yellow dot is below the you know zero line, so trust is declined. Even uh, you know take a country like Finland here, typically high trust society. No? The blue bar is very positive, quite long, but actually you know the country has gone in the wrong direction. You can see that actually in many countries. And that's not so much a surprise, you know, in the past you trusted governments because it was the only source that you had, you know, you, that's the only piece of information. Today, you know, people have access to lots of information. Some of it is contesting the claims that are being made by governments. People get, you know, confused. They get multiple sources of knowledge. So it's not so much a surprise, but just tells us we need to work harder to make sure that people have good information and trust in that kind of information. Now, on the positive side of it, when you actually ask teachers, why did you go into the job? You can see actually that nine out of 10 teachers on average across OECD countries choose that job because they wanted to make a difference to the lives of children and actually make a contribution to society. I think this is one of the most positive indications that we have because it really shows uh, the people who are at the front line today doing this work every day are there because they want to make a difference. No, they are not choosing this because it's a, just a secure job or provides a reliable income. Of course, those things matter as well. But actually, we have people that uh, have a very strong social motivation. No? The challenge for public policy is to give those people the space, the, the support. They need to live that expectations. We also see that actually for most teachers, actually it was their first choice, you know, at least the people who are still in the profession. It may well be that, you know, for some people who didn't choose it as their first choice, they can have moved out of the profession. But for most people actually that you will meet in most countries, they actually went into teaching because that was really the idea they had of the occupation. Again, something I think where education can uh, build on, you know, using that level of, of trust. When it comes to, you know, how they, uh, uh, how well they are prepared or feel prepared, 
that's where you can see we, we need to invest. You can see, you know, classroom management and instruction is something that most teachers feel really comfortable with. But when it comes to, <clears throat> for example, motivating students who show low interest in schoolwork, the bars get shorter, or using technology, or helping students think critically, or helping students value learning. Those are areas probably where we can do more to prepare our teachers. And that, again, will invest in strengths and trust in, in the system. Quality assurance is another lever of trust. Uh, you can see that most systems have done something around the internal evaluation or self-evaluation of schools. No? Very few countries where the bar is, you know, below 80 percent. But when it comes to you know, building an external perspective, uh, you can see that, uh, you know, figures are much, much lower on this. And this external perspective is as important as the internal perspective. What we what we've seen often is that when you only compare yourselves with, you know, your immediate peers, you may lose track of what really good performance is and students in disadvantaged areas or schools in disadvantaged areas may suddenly end up with a lower horizon for their work. So again, you know, reconciling that, you know, internal and external perspective in a constructive way is something that is really, really important. We also see when we ask ourselves, you know, what type of evaluation is done, uh, that uh, <clears throat> the, you know, students use of data or the formative purposes of data for students and for teachers are still the less pronounced aspects of evaluation and most evaluation is still quite you know summative in its nature and at the end of the learning process we tell you whether things go well or not but actually the idea that we integrate the world of learning and the world of um, assessment and make sort of learning and assessment one is still not very well established I wanted to just bring you uh, one example that I saw last November that uh, intrigued me quite a bit, you know, where I watched students in a classroom in Shanghai learning calligraphy. You know, that's one of the big headaches you have as a teacher there. You have to teach every student to learn, you know, 4,000 characters. You know, we struggle with 26 characters in, of the alphabet and they have to memorize a huge amount of information. And this is not just, you know, about, you know, learning. It's also about art. Basically, this is a very artistic kind of process where it's not only, you know, relevant whether you do this, you know, correct, but whether you do that well is a sense of, you know, <clears throat> for what, what, what you're doing. So wh while the students were drawing their correct characters, they had a scanner integrated in their table. And next to them, they had a little tablet. And that tablet was actually telling the student in real time uh, how they were doing. So they didn't wait, you know, for the teacher after the lesson or, you know, the next day or the next week to get, you know, things marked up in red. They were actually understanding in real time whether they were making mistakes, where they were struggling or where things were going really well. And the interesting thing was only when the students were really happy with their result, they pressed the green button and sent it to the teacher. So this very kind of private and confidential process of learning and assessment until I feel I'm good enough and then I ask my teacher. And the process didn't stop there. You know, at the end of the lesson, the teacher went in the next classroom and could actually see in real time how students were doing. Uh, here were, was a group of students making similar mistakes. So maybe I didn't explain things so well, or students from a similar social demographic uh, background struggled harder. So I need to provide those students with better support and help. So the student was a learner, the teacher was a learner, and the system was learning from from big data. That's really, I think, the future of evaluation and assessment where learning and evaluation are becoming one and where, you know, we learn, you know, all the time as a student, as a teacher, as a school and as an education system. But much of our evaluation uh, systems, you know, when you read this book, still very, very removed from those kinds of aspirations. The issue of addressing inequality a huge challenge for most education systems. And I just want to show you uh, one chart on this. Now you can see, for example, that learning outcomes still vary hugely by decile of social background. Now here, if you look at the left side, you can see results for the Dominican Republic. The red square shows you the uh, <clears throat> mathematics skills, the science skills, sorry, for the most disadvantaged students in the Dom D Dominican Republic and the green tri triangle the skills for the most privileged, where you can see there's a huge gap. And many of 
you look at this chart say, well, you know, that's normal. People from disadvantaged backgrounds just, you know, have fewer chances, fewer opportunities. The parents won't invest the time. They go to the less school. They see the poorer teachers. So, yeah, you get poorer results. Poverty is destiny. But then when you look at this across countries, you get really, really surprised. You can see, for example, that the 10% most disadvantaged students in the country, like Vietnam or Estonia, do as well as the average student in many OECD countries, and they do better than the 10% wealthiest students in much of South America. So actually, what this shows us is that it's not, you know, the student, it's where those students go to school and the country where to go, they go to school. So poverty need not be destiny. I think we should be a lot more ambitious when it comes to securing equitable learning opportunities. Now, comparative data uh, show that very clearly, and they also give us some, some of the reasons. For example, on the surface, it looks as if we are aligning resources with needs. You know, we make classes typically smaller for the more disadvantaged students. We put more teachers in a remote schools or disadvantaged schools, on average across country. Now, over the last decade, you know, one of the things that we can pride ourselves in is that formula-based funding has replaced blind funding in most countries. Now, you look at this publication, you can see most countries are now somehow aligning the quantity of resources with the needs of the students. Now, that looks great, but as soon as you turn to the quality, it flips the other way. Now, what you can see here is that the most qualified teachers actually teach our most privileged kids, no? and the most disadvantaged students end up with the teachers that don't have that kind of high, high, higher level of qualification. So yes, we put more money into a disadvantage, more teachers, but we are not yet good enough to align the quality of resources with uh, the needs of children. And this is about attracting the most talented teachers to the most challenging classes. Very few countries have figured that out, and we need to sort of understand more how they have made it maybe financially or maybe intellectually attractive for the best teachers to actually work in those conditions. We can probably also learn from, from other fields. You know, if you are a medical doctor, you would want to make the most difficult operation, not the standard one. You want to work with the kind of most complex kind of environment. No? So we have sort of made it attractive for people to take on challenges in education we probably can do a lot better on this. And you can see that summarized in this chart, in most countries, actually, the quality of resource allocation is deeply regressive. Uh, disadvantaged schools have fewer resources than advantaged schools, particularly when you look at the shortage of educational staff. Now, very, very few countries have made it to the green area where you can say more qualified teachers are actually ending up with the more disadvantaged students. So the second message, uh, well, also here still, you know, we can see that also we send typically the incoming teachers to the more difficult schools. Often we say, well, you know, the more years of service you have, the more we allow you to choose where you want to work. We sometimes even give you much more money and so on. And then the new people who just graduate from teacher training will just dump them in the school where nobody else wants to teach. No? That's the picture you can see here. And this is just the average picture. I could show you countries where this looks a lot worse than this. Again, you would want to do the opposite. You would want to get the most experienced teachers in the schools where you find, you know, the largest share of immigrant students or the largest share of socially, economically disadvantaged homes. Lots of work uh, to do. Uh, second last point, strengthening coherence, no? making sure that what we want to achieve in the long term is well aligned with what we actually do in the short term. And when I say long term, transcending electoral cycles. Now, most educational changes and reforms uh, will play out over many, many years to be successful. Now, investing in teachers, changing the mindset of teachers. Now, we only change our behavior when we see that's going to play out in the long run and not in the kind of political cycle. So making sure that what we do today is going to be consistent with what we do tomorrow. And again, this comes back to the question of trust. If teachers or school leaders have that perception that, you know, they're just, you know, pushing something on us tomorrow, and then, you know, in another few years, this is going to be done, undone, and or the opposite is going to come into play, they're not going to trust 
policy reforms. They're just going to continue to do what they have always done. So again, those things are really, really important. And uh, when you actually look at how systems are governed, you can see that there is huge variability. You can take a country like the Netherlands, where nine out of 10 decisions about anything that is being done are, are done by the school. The school have a lot of ownership over what they do. And when you look to Turkey and Greece and Switzerland, it's less than one in 10 decisions taken by the school. Many decisions there are taken by local governments, by regional governments, or by the central government. So this is a highly, highly complex field and ensuring that, you know, those players are working, you know, consistently across levels, consistently over time and consistently over space is very, very important. We see from the uh, PISA data that actually engaging uh, school leaderships, now building, uh, engaging school principals, engaging teachers in questions around resources, curriculum, disciplinary policies, assessment policies, is actually tends to be positively associated with results. No? Cause and effect could go both ways. I acknowledge that. But there's a tendency that actually, you know, strong principles that are empowered and strong teachers that uh, walking with a high degree of professional autonomy tend to walk in schools that do have uh, better results. So how do we actually strengthen that ownership in a kind of government governance framework for every layer of the system plays a meaningful role. And as I already mentioned, that is becoming increasingly complex. Now you have local authorities that gain in importance. Now you have school boards, school providers. You look at the publication, you can see actually the voices of those stakeholders have grown over the last year. Now, the role of the media. Sometimes public policy say we don't do any kind of rankings. And then the media are gonna you know, make up their own ones. You have researchers you know, playing a role, parents, uh, becoming increasingly uh, vocal. They actually can now communicate, they can pronounce their views. Now. So actually governance has become a lot more complex and ensuring coherence and consistency and fidelity in policy implementation is a formidable challenge that we need to acknowledge. Very last point is really about looking not just you know uh, forward, but also looking upwards providing opportunities, more opportunities for teachers to learn from other teachers, for schools to learn from other schools, and from education systems to learn from other systems. Also there, there's a lot of scope for you know, meaningful sharing of policy experience. That's what this book is about. That's what the education policy dialogues are about, where we're actually working today and tomorrow with policymakers from around the world to figure out, you know, how do we actually implement tomorrow's education policies? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Andreas. We've had a number of questions come in. Uh, the first one is about school leaders. They've asked, there seems to be lots of policy developments related to teachers, but not so man, much mention of school leaders. Uh, what have education systems been doing to help school leaders fulfill their very important role? Yeah, it's a very valid point. You know, I think uh, the kind of framework that school leaders establish for their teachers have a huge impact on the organization, on the motivation, on, on almost anything. Uh, and it, it's true. Uh, actually, I, I should have perhaps talked more about it. You'll find a lot of material about school leaders in the book, but it's true that it's still a minor part. There's still a lot more emphasis on the teaching uh, profession than it is on the, uh, on, on the leadership in the school system. And you can see that reflected in many, many kind of aspects. In most countries, for example, school, the pay of school leaders is not that much better than the pay for teachers. And so on. So I think uh, whoever made that comment made a fair point. I think policy attention, you know, we should probably, uh, you could make that argument even, you know, local administrations, building capacities there is often the middle layers in the system that uh, don't get the ascension, uh, attention they deserve. Particularly when we talk, you know, raising school autonomy, it also means that we need to invest in the capacity of people to do things that they were not responsibility, responsible for in the past, like the human resource development of the school, school financing and so on. So yeah, school leading leadership has become a very demanding profession. Another question came in similar, uh, but this time about students. Can students be involved in the process of policy reform? And, and if so, how? 
Very good point as well. And again, you know, I think we should just acknowledge when we look at, uh, across the world that uh, the student voice is not yet recognized in the design of policies. Now, sometimes students are students are still largely treated as consumers of learning environments, not as co-creators of of learning environments. And uh, but where you do ask students, they offer often a extremely relevant and interesting ideas. Students have a very good eye on you know what good learning environments really look like. Uh, they have interesting thoughts on what students uh, should and need to be learning. They have uh, often very good appreciation of the quality of the teaching and learning environment. So yeah, I think education should be paying more attention to the views of, of students than what we see. And certainly in, in this in this publication, there's very little on that. Um, I would like to make um, two comments, one about school leaders and the other one about um, engagement of, of students. In terms of school leadership, uh, one finding that was very interesting of this report was that um, we asked uh, participating education systems about their priorities and also about how the, uh, these priorities have evolved over the last 10 years. And what was very interesting was that there was a lot of attention on teachers and a lot less on the school leadership profession when um, they are your real implementers of education policy in the system. They, they make sure that um, the tensions between other policy reforms, uh, that they make sense at the school level. So um, it is uh, a necessary investment uh, in the improvement of an education system to work with school leaders to develop um, teacher uh, um, career pathways that, that are really reflecting the complexity of their work. Um, and we have um, collected some examples, for example, in uh, Australia or Portugal of long lasting efforts uh, in terms of school leadership. But, um, and now in terms of uh, student engagement, in the education policy outlook, we have been uh, uh, undertaking a research about um, policies that engage students and uh, also findings um, from our thematic work to show that it is uh, very, very important to um, undertake policies that understand the complexity of the different worlds where the student lives. And this means uh, the school, uh, the um, uh, society, uh, the family, this, these different worlds converge into one. And uh, we need to understand how the student navigates to all of them to um, establish uh, policies that are meaningful. And also parents, uh, they are an important stakeholder. And um, policies need to take in consideration these two aspects. There's been a couple of questions kind of getting at the same point, so I'll try and consolidate them. Um, people are pointing out uh, about how different education systems are across the world, and the major point of, of their comments is about how useful it is to, to look at other policies that are implemented in different countries. What's the value in it? Yeah, you know, I think that's a question that is uh, always asked. You know, to what extent can what works in one context be relevant in another context? Um, yeah, to some extent, contexts vary and policies need to be adapted. You cannot copy and paste school systems wholesale, but you can still ask yourselves, you know, what are the drivers of success in a specific context and how can you configure those drivers in another context? You know, one country that is doing that extremely well has been Singapore. Actually, when you go to Singapore, you see very few things that you haven't seen anywhere else. They have been able to reconfigure those things from many countries, from many places, so much better than what we do in most of our countries that uh, they get superior results. I think that's really the question, not you know how you can copy and paste the system or policy, but how you understand the drivers of a policy to actually reconfigure it in your own context so that it delivers superior results. I also want to make another point. You know, yeah, we see a lot of variation. You know, I showed you this differences in spending, but often that just reflects very idiosyncratic histories. You, know, you cannot find an actually meaningful explanation for some of those differences. Now, why do countries make different choices between you know, the size of class and the, and the quality of teachers? Uh, these are questions around history, you know, the political economy, 
and so on, but not about substance. So when you get to the heart of the matter, how do students actually learn? Uh, students are students, and actually they learn, you know, mathematics and science in very similar ways. And uh, the fact that those things vary hugely across classrooms, across schools, and across countries often have to do that we are not very good in learning from each other and with each other. So yes, I have some sympathy with this question, but at, at the same time, I believe there's a lot of potential for teachers to learn from other teachers, for schools to learn from other schools, and for systems to learn from other systems. And I think many of the policies, when you look, for example, I mentioned you know, this problem of inequalities in resource allocation. Uh, you look at countries doing this well, or systems doing that well, Shanghai in China has been very successful in attracting the most talented teachers to the most challenging schools. They create career incentives. You know, if you're a vice principal in a high performing school and one day you want to become principal, the only way to get there is to turn around one of the lowest performing schools. There's nothing that will prevent that kind of idea to be implemented in another country. So again, you know, I think many policies or elements of those are actually quite uh, easy to, to learn from. But the biggest barrier that we have is that we often create very artificial walls around us that we say, you know, I can't learn from you because you're different from me, uh, or I don't uh, access your research, so I can't learn from that. So again, you know, yeah, some sympathy with this question, but I do not think that we are anywhere near for exhausting the potential for peer learning that we have. Someone else has asked, uh, considering all of the messages presented here, how can we ensure the balance between centralization and decentralization in an education system? Yeah, that's one of the most difficult questions. And in fact, a lot of the volume is devoted to exactly that issue. And the, I think, you know, when you <clears throat> look around countryside, the, the one takeaway for me is really that we should put student learning at the center. And uh, how do students learn best? And then think about, you know, what discretion and support do need no teachers to support that student learning? And then ask ourselves, you know, what does it require in terms of leadership and the work environment and the work organization in schools? And what support do schools need from their local area to actually, you know, build those kinds of learning environments? And what can the regional government and the central government do to support it? So rather than thinking, you know, here is the central government. Let's think about what we decentralize. Put it the other way around. Think about, you know, what can you do to support uh, the people for whom you work? And I think um, education systems that uh, take that approach, uh, Estonia and Finland are very good examples where every decision is taken in a framework of what we you know serves student learning best. I think we will achieve a much more a coherent and much more productive government er governance arrangement than we have, you know, different layers in the system that struggle for, you know, competence and responsibility. So this question of subsidiarity, in my view, is really, really important. And no level of government should do anything that a level below that could actually do at least as well. Thank you, Andreas, and thank you, Diana. I think that's all we have time for. Uh, but I want to thank the participants for your interest in this topic and on the OECD's work on education in general. If you'd like to find out more about the Education Policy Outlook 2019, you can find the publication on the OECD iLibrary. Uh, this webinar has also been recorded and will be made available on our YouTube page, which is EduSkills OECD. Once again, thank you for joining us.